I think the first project I ever worked on was back in the mid 90s when I was with Helber Hastert and Young here in Singapore. That was the Bali Noana Golf Resort in Tanalot, down way out in the east of Bali, west of Bali. Um, one of the things I do remember mostly about it was the fact that we integrated the, some of the existing paddy fields, rice fields, into the design. I think it was one of the first times that it was ever done where we actually took the natural attribute of the site and kept it in, in the actual design. So you put them obviously out of play area, but it was the fact that you could bring in the sort of local culture, make it really unique. And I think that's what stayed with me for most of my life. That's an easy one. It's Sangeeta um, Lodge down in Tanzania. It's one of the most incredible sights I've ever seen, one of the most exper incredible experiences I've ever had as well where this American guy had leased half a million hectares of land and wanted to build seven resorts on this, this incredible piece of the sort of prairie right beside the Serengeti National Park. And so it was just incredible because of what he had to do. It was essentially a lodge for, for rich people, expensive lodge. Um, but what he had to do to get the animals back was just, just incredible, the whole sustainability side of it, because Previously to that, it had been set up as a hunting block by Nereri, the ex-president of Tanzania. And so consequently, all the animals went away. And when the animals go away, the grass changes. And so, first of all, he had to burn the entire lot to get all the grasses to grow again. Then the animals came back. And of course, with the animals came the poachers. And so we had to get rid of the poachers as well. So I had this incredible story going on in the background when essentially it was just a seven room resort sitting on top of a hill. Um, and then on top of that, we used the local, he used the local workers. Um, they went up one hill one day and found this guy sitting there with a hammer and chisel and a young kid with him and he was cutting uh, stone blocks. So they gave him 10 hammers and 10 chisels and said, can you build everything or cut everything for the, for the entire lodge? So suddenly this guy was an employer. We had an employment and things. And then in each of the villages he went around, they, they had the same number of workers from each one. And then they built a well they, they made, gave them a generator. So they started to just sort of develop the entire region. So great story, except some of the chiefs were sort of anti this because if they, if they had a well, then they didn't have to go to the river to get the water. So what were people gonna do? And so they were getting worried about the whole social fabric of their, of their village. So it's just incredible. And they just had all these other knock-on effects. And then I remember one day we were up on the hill and this guy pushed his bicycle all the way to the top of it and he had like three little carrots in the back of tray and he came up to sell them. And it was like his capitalism right from the very, very start. You know, it was, was just a, quite an incredible story. And then from our side, of course, you go down there and you, we went down several times. We had to stay in tents. So in the middle of the night, you'd wake up and you'd hear the lion walking around your tent, uh, make sure you didn't want to get out. Um, but just getting up in the morning and they said, you want to go for an animal drive, right? And you'd go out and have a look at the animals. And on like a third trip, you go, nah, I'm just going to sleep in. <laughs> it's what people save up their, their whole life to go for a, a trip. And here we were just incredibly lucky to get out there in the middle of the middle of the wilderness and see animals for what they really are. No fences, no nothing. It was just, it was just the most amazing experience. Yeah, I know that one. That's <laughs> the biggest risk was starting landscape. Way back in early 2000s, Tom, Tom Russell, the MD of, of London office at the time, he got the architecture contract for doing the Sheraton Heliopolis in Egypt. And he came to me one day and said, we've got this massive atrium, five stories tall, taking up the whole of the ground floor uh, on podium. Can you do the landscape? We go, yeah, of course we can. And then we tried to figure out how to do it. but. That was certainly a risk because we really didn't know what we were doing. We, we brought in people and then we basically established the landscape team then because prior to that, we'd never really done a, a full landscape job um, within the company. So hence the birth of the landscape crew. I'm not sure I'd really change anything. There's a couple of things I wish I'd done. And one of them is having had the opportunity of being out here in Asia, you know, the, the center of the future of the world. Um, is my regret that I never picked up a local language. Uh, it's one of the downfalls of starting with English. You get lazy and you don't learn another language, but on hindsight, I, I really should have spent the time and effort um, to pick up one of the local languages. I know there's a lot to choose from, uh, but yeah, it's probably my biggest 
regret and something that if I started again, I would definitely change. Wow. I don't know. Everyone seems to say I'm a good mentor. I'm not sure. I don't really have, there's no rule book. I'm not really sure. It's be yourself. Give them advice, give them help. Set them up for a few difficult times. Um, just coach them. I, I, I really don't know. But yeah, people have said that I am a good mentor. But I think it's, it's down to people to want to learn as well, to listen to you. But I, I think it's just being natural, being encouraging more than anything. And it's a bit like having your own family, your kids. You've got to encourage them. You've got to tell them off. You've got to be there for them. But you don't want to do everything for them. Um, I can say that because some of my team out here are actually younger than my kids. So, you know, you, you just um, help them on their way, just as you would as a parent or a, or a friend. Um, pick up when they do well, encourage them definitely. Um, and just don't really give them answers, but just make them answer, answer their own questions. But I'm, I'm, I don't think there's a real, real set of rules in there at all. Just be observant. It's it's all out there. Just um, just observe. Just look. It's every time you go home, you you're seeing something. I mean, I go for a lot of bike rides here in Singapore because from the planning side, right? You go through the back areas, you see things. You go, oh, that's how that works. Oh, that's where that goes. That's a good adjacency. Oh, I'd never put that next to each other. But if you just keep your eyes open and observe, right? We're never like on holiday or turned off. We're not switched off. You just gotta look around the whole environment is what we're trying to design um, you just gotta gotta look at it experience it see it for what it is Larry Helber Larry was the eponymous founder of Helber Hastert Planners and I met him in Singapore in 1994 then known as HH&Y it was the Asian planning arm of WATG up until about 1998 when the two companies parted ways Larry immediately took me under his wing and taught me everything I know about resort master planning and Larry and I became good friends. I managed to serve a stint in the Hawaii office and later to visit him at home in Hawaii during his retirement. I owe Larry for employing a straggler when I was traveling around Asia with a lousy portfolio and setting me loose along the planning path. I learned the essentialness of walking every inch of a site and how to work with topography and how to maximize the integration and adjacencies of various land use components. John Elliott. John was nothing if not a real character, as only Brits can be. He was cantankerous, humorous, and dedicated to resort architecture. His deep commitment was to the Middle East, where, as a fresh graduate, he started out in the UAE, first taking the boundary line between the UAE and KSA, and then introducing roundabouts to the region, a claim that always got him laughing. My most momentous memory of working with John was a site visit down to meet the Bahrain's new king, Sheikh Abdullah bin Hamad bin Isa Al Khalifa, who immediately named three WATG creations as hotels he loved around the world. John taught me so much about the Arab mindset and their customs, from being able to recognize a person's tribe and allegiances from the way they wear their kefir, and how to shake your coffee cup to indicate you wanted no more. Greg Coghill. I'd only met Greg periodically during my early years at HH&Y and WATG, but I really got to know him when I moved to Irvine for two years just prior to my second stint here in Singapore. He was a COO at the time, and when I asked him why he never gave me any direction or instructions, he just replied that planning always made money, so he just left me alone. To me, Greg was a kind and patient person who loved family and golf. He was always a great counsel and listener, especially while out on the golf course. Thank you.